And uh, I'm excited about this. I call it a mini-series. We're going to be in Isaiah 53 for a few weeks. And um, before we get into Isaiah, it's going to take a minute for us to get uh, to Isaiah 53 to start. But um, the Bible is an amazing book. Amen? Amen? There is no book that's ever been written like it. It's 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years. Some were lawyers, some were doctors, some were farmers, some were fishermen. And yet the ultimate author, inspiration, given by Almighty God. Uh, there are things in the Bible, if you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God today, first of all, we're glad that you're here, because we do, and we believe it can change your life, but you can't deny that the Bible's an old book, right? It's a very old book. So if you don't believe it's the Word of God, you can at least agree that it's very old, and the stuff that's inside of it, um, I just have a hard time believing that if this stuff is true, then how could it not be the Word of God, right? It has to be the Word of God. And how, how do you measure if the Bible is what it claims to be? Well, there are several different ways you can do this. One, does it, does it accurately, um, let me, how to put this a different way. Uh, the prophecies that it, that it gives, do, do they actually come to pass? Because there are a lot of different faiths who give prophecies, right? The, the Mormon founder, Joseph Smith, gave prophecies that Jesus would return by 1891. Um, that didn't happen, obviously. Uh, that the Holy Temple would be rebuilt in Missouri, of all places, the Show Me State. I mean, seriously, <laughs> come on. Uh, uh, he also predicted in 1832, which was about the time Brian was born, right? I'm just playing, bro. I love you, man. If you're new at Bridgeway, I really do love Brian, and I meant nothing by that. Yeah. Oh, it was when Billy was born. Thank you, Barb. Um, in 1832, around Christmas time, he predicted that the sun would disappear for many days. Uh, that didn't happen either, because, well, first of all, everybody on earth would die. But nonetheless, um, the Jehovah Witnesses have made different predictions also about when Christ would return, 1918, 1917, and 1925. Uh, there's a prophet, his name, well, a false prophet named Muhammad, who also made some different prophecies, and surprise, surprise, none of them have come to pass, maybe except for the one where he says a lot of people are going to die, and that was really his fault. Um, the Bible makes over 2,500 prophecies, 2,000 of which have already come to pass and been fulfilled to the T. That's pretty good. They have a pretty good track record, I would say, right? So if you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, you'd have a hard time explaining how it could predict the future so accurately, right? It's the Word of God. It makes, it makes prophecies about entire nations. I mean, think about this. Uh, it makes prophecies about Greece, that its ruler would die at a young age, and it would be split into four different uh, sections. When Alexander the Great did die, they split his kingdom up among four generals. The Bible predicted that. Uh, it makes um, predictions about... Uh, the fall of Babylon. In fact, Isaiah, the guy who wrote Isaiah 53, obviously, uh, made a prediction about a guy named Cyrus was going to rise up and conquer Babylon, which when he wrote that, was, Babylon was a, a force to be reckoned with. And he wrote that 150 years before a guy named Cyrus was ever born, yet it did come to pass. It made prophecy about an entire nation, the nation of Israel, being enslaved for 400 years, which that also came to pass. I'd say they're doing pretty good. God's doing pretty good at guessing the future, right? Because he's God and he knows everything. Uh, the Bible even states some scientific facts, which, um, surprise, surprise, are pretty accurate according to our science today. You know, science isn't the enemy of the Bible. It actually reaffirms what God has already done. Um, the Bible talks about ocean currents in, in the Psalms, which weren't discovered until... 1854 by Matthew Morey. Uh, it talks about an expanding universe, which we didn't know about until the 20th century. It talks about blood being essential for life. That wasn't, that wasn't discovered until the 19th century. You guys remember our president, George Washington, right? You know how he died? He bled to death. Bloodletting was a, a medical practice where they thought they could get the sickness out of you by letting your blood go out. If they simply had read the Bible, they would have known that the president needed all that blood that they <laughs> spilled. Uh, it talks about the earth being round. The Lord sits on the circle of the earth, it says. Uh, that wasn't discovered until the 15th century. Uh, scripture also says that the earth hangs on nothing. They said that at a time when people thought the earth was on the back of a big cow. Um, yeah, really. Uh, or on the back of a guy who was holding it up. That wasn't discovered until 1650. 
talks about the first and second law of thermodynamics and so on and so forth. So the Bible, as far as I can tell right now, the Bible knows what it's talking about. Amen? It's pretty, pretty accurate, I would say. But let's think about this. What if the Bible had a bunch of predictions about a single individual? One person, it's going to say a bunch of stuff's going to happen in that individual's life, and then it all happens. I mean, it's done a pretty good job so far. There are well over 100 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. In fact, Matthew Mori, a mathematician, um, Matthew Stoner, rather, a mathematician, um, he, he did a, a, a formula of the, the likelihood of 48 of the prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus being fulfilled in anybody's life. The probability of just 48 of them being fulfilled in anybody's life. Uh, and he said it was 1 in 13 trillion. So basically impossible. The things that took place in Jesus' life. You know, the, the Old Testament, it predicts where Jesus will be born. You don't have any control over that, right? You can't say where you're going to be born. Uh, it said he's where, where he's going to be born, that he'd end up in Egypt. Um, it said that how he was going to die, uh, his hands being pierced back when crucifixion didn't even exist. They're writing about crucifixion. Um, it talks about not even a bone of him being broken. It even goes down to the fine details of how much money he would be betrayed for. 30 pieces of silver. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy about Jesus Christ, and it comes to be fulfilled in his life. What I'm trying to say to you is that the Bible is God's word. It doesn't return void. It's powerful. It's the best-selling book ever. People have tried to kill it, and they've tried to stop it, but they can't. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. In, in fact, in October, we're going to have a Bible prophecy conference. There's a lot of stuff going on in Israel right now, as you know, and all of it has a lot to do with uh, the prophecies mentioned in Scripture. And that'll be in October. I want to encourage you to come to that and look for that coming up. But before we dive into Isaiah 53, uh, I want to kind of paint a picture in your mind real fast. And uh, so we're going to start in Acts chapter number 8. And uh, before I have you stand, let me just lay this out for you. There's a, a man, he works for the government of Ethiopia, and he's kind of on a caravan sent from his government. And... Um, so he's on his way, and he's traveling with his posse, essentially, and they stop for a pit stop to get some McDonald's and fill up the, the car, right? And um, Philip, who was a deacon, he's led of the Holy Spirit to go and talk to this guy. And he notices that this guy's reading the Bible. So it's like you've been walking through Mickey D's, you see someone reading the Bible, and he's like, hey, okay, Lord wants me to talk to that person. And so he sits down across the table, he gets a Big Mac and fries, and he's ready to talk to him. And this is what transpires. So let's stand together. Acts chapter 8. We'll start in verse 30. It says, And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, which would be the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Do you know what you're reading, man? And he said, How can I? This is the, the Ethiopian eunuch saying, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read was this. And this will sound very, very familiar to you in just a few minutes. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and, a, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so he opened, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaks the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Thank you. You may be seated. He starts in Isaiah 53 to preach unto this individual, Jesus Christ. There was a, a, a professor that um, uh, had gone to, before he was a professor, had gone to his workplace. And uh, he took Isaiah 53 and he took all the verses out. He took, took the scripture reference out. And he went to his co-workers. He said, I want you to read this paragraph. I want you to tell me who it's about and where it's found in the Bible. And his co-workers read Isaiah 53. And they said, well, it's obviously talking about Jesus. And it was probably written in one of the Gospels. And he said, well, you're right. It is talking about Jesus. But it was not written in the Gospels. It was written 700 years before Jesus physically comes on the scene. What you're going to read today is a chapter that's 700 years before Jesus is born, it predicts almost to a T what he's going to experience. In fact, Isaiah 53 in the Old Testament is probably the most specific chapter about Jesus. 
about the Messiah. Uh, the, the title of our series is, is called The Forbidden Chapter. Why is it called that, you might ask? Well, there are some rabbis who will skip this chapter altogether when doing a study on Isaiah. Now, there are ones who will tackle this chapter, but they will proclaim that Isaiah 53 is talking about Israel or talking about Jeremiah. It's not talking about Jesus, which is, is interesting because up until the 12th century, uh, rabbis taught that Isaiah 53 was a messianic chapter, meaning it's a chapter about the Messiah that is to come. But when the 12th century got there, for some reason, they decided to change that teaching and say, no, it's not talking about the Messiah. It's apparently talking about someone else. And their root of belief is because they, they don't believe Jesus is God in the flesh. So it is called the forbidden chapter by some. It's also called the gospel of God um, by others. And so this chapter is extremely unique. And maybe you've never read it before, or maybe you've read it just kind of like skimming over it. But um, just prepare to be blown away at the, the detail mentioned about Jesus' life. And we're going to see this in every verse. We're going to be studying verses 1 through 3 today. But let's read, and you can stay seated for this, but let's look at this chapter that Philip was explaining to this Ethiopian to tell him all about Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 53. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, he was crucified with thieves, and with the rich, he was buried in a rich man's tomb, in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was there uh, any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. And when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Who on earth could it be talking about? I can't think of any person throughout history this could be talking about other than Jesus Christ. Now this, this chapter is really a, a, a sorrowful uh, chapter. It, it, it describes in detail the darkest time in all of human history. Uh, the day that, that God died, but it also is describing the most victorious event to ever take place in human history. The fact that Jesus made himself an offering for every single person in this room and every single person outside this room. Isn't that awesome? That he willingly endured what, what this chapter describes. And so I want us to deal with the rejection of Christ this morning uh, in the first a few verses and so the first thing we're going to look at here in Isaiah 53 is the predictions about the Savior that were rejected. Notice verse 1. It says, Who hath believed our report? Isaiah just kind of lays it out there. Who's believed what we've said? Who has believed the message of the Messiah that is to come? And he was pointing out to his fellow countrymen that they were going to possibly play an important part and they could play an important part of the coming Messiah, but of course they would not listen to Isaiah. Who's believed us? You know, you may have people uh, that you're trying to win to Christ. Um, I know I do. And some, for whatever reason, 
ha have reasons of, you know, does, first of all, does God exist? Or is God morally good? Uh, so on and so forth, different reasons. But the, the main reason people don't accept the Lord is because they don't believe his book. They don't believe the Bible. That's the root cause of all of it. Because if you simply believe the Bible, you're going to believe the author, right? And so that's the root problem that Isaiah talks about. Who's believed us? Has anybody believed what I've said? This rings true when, when Paul is, in his day, trying to preach to his fellow countrymen in Romans 10. Take a look at this. He says, How then shall they call on him whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him and whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Man, right there, Paul's smacking us in the face, first of all. He says, how are they going to believe on someone they know nothing about? You know something about him, so you better talk about him, is what he's saying. How are they going to hear without a preacher? And he's not talking about a preacher in my context. He's talking about all of us being preachers, all of us preaching the message of the gospel to everybody all around us. Verse 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah, he's going to quote Isaiah here. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He says, those who have heard have not all obeyed the gospel. And he just refers right to Isaiah. Who's believed us? Has anybody believed us? Well, let's understand something, church, that the way is narrow. Few there be that find it. There are going to be plenty of people who will reject the gospel, but not all of them will reject the gospel. You know, uh, I think it was Bertrand Russell, the uh, atheistic philosopher, when he was asked um, if he met God, if God did exist, what well, he would ask him. And I think his question was, uh, why did you make it so hard for us to know you? But the reality of that is, I think when, when if, if, if you're here today and you don't believe in God, um, I think when you stand before God and ask him that question, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think his response is going to be, seriously? How did I make it so hard for you to know me? First of all, do you not see everything that I made out of absolutely nothing, and yet you thought it was a giant accident? Are you kidding me? How I made everything with precision, precise, fine-tuned, everything in, in my creation, I created perfectly without anybody's help, and yet you looked at it and said, oh, it must have just been happenstance? Are you kidding me? Or the fact that I came down there physically and walked among you, rubbed shoulders with you, lived life as, as you lived? Are you kidding me? And furthermore, that I wrote a book and I left it for you and I left my church to tell you about it and you're going to tell me that it was hard to know me? Who hath believed our report? And there will be those who reject. In fact, today people still reject. We know this to be true, but they've, they've got to hear it nonetheless. I will say the percentage of your success in, in sharing Christ and people coming to Christ, and I, I shouldn't say success necessarily, because our job, if you're sharing Jesus, you're successful, okay? Because only God can save someone. You can't save anybody. I didn't know if you knew that, but you are incapable of saving anybody. Your job is the mailman, remember? You deliver the message, it's up to the recipient to respond. You're not a salesman. Let the Holy Spirit do its work. But for the most part, majority of the people you'll talk to will probably not accept Christ, but there will be some, and that should motivate you. Don't be discouraged if the majority reject you. They rejected Jesus. We should be used to rejection. And then celebrate when someone accepts. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. There are some people who think you're absolutely crazy. That you believe in an almighty God who sent his son who died for you and rose again and loves you and wants a personal relationship with you. There are some who will say you're absolutely crazy for believing so. Of course, the alternative is believing that everything happened uh, by accident, that non-life produces life and unconsciousness produces consciousness, and we're the crazy ones, right? <laughs> there was a, a soap manufacturer and a, a pastor walking down the street one day. And um, 
The soap manufacturer wasn't a believer, and he challenged the pastor. He said, you know, the gospel hasn't done much good in this world. He said, look around you. There's, there's evil. There's wickedness. There's, there's a lot of, of wicked people. And just then they passed a little boy who's playing in his front yard in a mud puddle, building mud pies. The pastor looked at the boy, and he said, you know, soap hasn't done much good for the world. There's still dirt, and there's still dirty people. Soap manufacturer replied, he said, well, soap's only good when it's applied to you. And the pastor said, so is the gospel. It's only good when you apply it. It's only good when you believe it. If it's set off by itself, you've got to accept the message. Who's believed our report, Isaiah says. Who believed what Jesus, uh, what was wrote about Jesus? Who believes it? I believe it. I know it's true. I hope that becomes a reality for your life. And, and if you are saved, this should encourage you and this should, should challenge you that what you believe is true. You should know this. His word doesn't return void. It's powerful. They not only rejected the predictions, they rejected the power of Jesus. It says, who is believed or important to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? That's referring to the power of God. See, in Isaiah's time, the people didn't really see a lot of God's power, a lot of unbelief going on. But when Jesus came onto the scene, one of the ways you would know he is God in the flesh was by the miracles that he would do. In fact, remember when John the Baptist was doubting if Jesus was the Messiah? What did Jesus basically say back to him? Hey, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised to life, the, the sick are healed. John, it's happening. He would show up on the scene and he would do things that nobody had ever done before. He would say things that nobody had ever heard before. And so when Jesus comes onto the scene and starts doing this stuff, some people are blown away. That's why thousands of people wanted to listen to Jesus. That's why there was multitudes who wanted to hear his sermons. Of course, the multitude didn't, doesn't stick around. But John 12 really lays this out for us when it comes to the fact that the power of God had been revealed and people rejected it. John 12, 37. But, through, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed, what? Not on him. That the saying of Isaiah, or Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which spake, who hath believed our report, and to whom uh, hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Jesus comes on the scene and starts healing everybody. And for the scoffers who were like, well, yeah, maybe they could have got better on their own. He's like, okay, there's a guy who's been dead four days. Watch this. He's alive. I don't know if he made that sound necessarily. <laughs> but nonetheless, I've heard people say, you know, wouldn't it make sense for Jesus to have come now? Look at all the technology we have. Look at all the access that we have. Brent, we have YouTube for crying out loud. I mean, Jesus showing up and doing miracles on YouTube, it could go viral, and everybody would believe it'd be more popular than Gangman Style and Charlie Bit Me. Those are YouTube videos, in case. Never mind. Uh, but it would go viral, would it not? It'd be on the evening news. This guy walked on water, and they would say, well, it's a magic trick. I've seen Chris Angel do that, too, so it's not true. There would be scoffers. Jesus could show up and do all those miracles, right? He could have done that at, at our time, but there'd still be multitudes of people who wouldn't believe in fact, when the Pharisees saw Jesus heal a guy on the Sabbath, you know what they said? They weren't like, man, he's got to be God. They were like, he just broke the law. Does that make sense? He just broke the law. Shame on him. He just healed a man. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Is this, this power has been shown. Jesus has shown up. He's done incredible things, and people still don't believe. There are miracles taking place today. Greater miracles than people being healed are lives being changed. In fact, Jesus told his, his apostles, you'll do greater things than these after he had healed some people. What is he talking about? You're going to deliver a message about me that is going to take a man who is dead spiritually and is going to make him alive. That's greater than someone being sick, being healed. Why? Because it's eternal, not temporary. So there are millions of miracles taking place today, and yet people don't believe. Can you imagine how frustrated God must be? They won't, they, they won't accept the message. They don't accept the power. They won't accept the person of Jesus. Notice verses 2 and 3. For he shall grow up before him as a tender 
plant. Jesus, when he comes on the scene, it's not like a, a, a big conqueror. He's born in a stable. He's poor. I mean, Jesus had it rough. He didn't grow up with all the nice stuff all the other kids have. He, 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 was, he was a poor uh, a kid in, in a poor town. So as a, he grew up as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire. And basically, he's not going to be what you expect. And Jesus didn't meet everyone's expectations. That's why they killed him. He says he has no form, no comeliness. He's not, there's no attractiveness to Jesus. There's no beauty that you should desire him. When I was, when I was the, the college pastor in Wilmington, we did a, a Bible study at Wilmington College. And one of our Bible studies was, uh, what if Jesus had a Facebook and, um, you know, you, you catch up with different friends of yours that you went to school with on Facebook, right? And um, people you went to school with, you've known your whole life. And can you imagine growing up with Jesus, being in grade school with Jesus? It's hard enough if you were one of his brothers, but it would be tough. And so you've gone to school with this guy, and, and maybe he was, you know, uh, quiet. We don't know. But I don't think he looked like the, the guy in The Passion of the Christ, a good-looking guy who was well-built. I'm sure he wasn't overly scrawny, although I don't know for sure. He was, he was a, a, a carpenter, so he did do some hard work. I, he wouldn't have been the, the, the most popular kid in school. And so, you know, he, maybe for the senior yearbook, he got voted most likely to be the Messiah. We really don't know, but nonetheless... You, 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 you join him uh, as a Facebook friend later on, and his occupation at that time is he's a carpenter. He's 23 years old. Hey, what's Jesus doing? Oh, he picked up his dad's business, and he's doing good. He built my mom and dad's deck the other day, and made his great work. He's honest, and what he says you're going to pay is, is he's not going to try to, to cheat you out of any money. He's going to do the work. He's going to get it done. And then you're friends with him. You see different posts from time to time, and then he gets to being 30 years old, and he comes out and he says, uh, you, you notice in your news feed that his job description changed from carpenter to I am God. I'm the Savior of the world. I'm the Messiah. I'm not what you think I am. I'm much more than that. And then, yeah, he probably does post pictures of him doing incredible things, right? He wanted people to know how powerful he was, how powerful his God was, how powerful his Father was, the Holy Spirit. He wanted to show that he is who he claimed to be. Can you imagine being a friend of Jesus his, his whole life and then being like, seriously, Jesus, you're the son of God? And there were people who experienced that. When Jesus went to his hometown and preached, do you know what happened? He said he could do no great miracle there. Why? Because of their unbelief. They said, isn't this Joseph's son, Joseph the carpenter? They didn't say this is the savior of the world. He has no form. He has no comeliness. You know, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's not what people thought. When he does show up, they expected him. Think about the triumphal entry. If you're not familiar, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, and everybody is like, they're, they're stoked because Jesus Christ, they're saying, hey, the Messiah is here. They're, they're like throwing their, their clothes down in palm leaves and like, this is it. It's Passover. There's thousands upon thousands of Jews there, and this is the leader of our rebellion. That's what they think. Remember, Jesus stops and he starts weeping uncontrollably. Why? Because they didn't get it. His kingdom was spiritual, not physical. He didn't come there to kill the Romans. He came there to save the Romans. And they rejected him. Why? Because he didn't meet their expectations. Maybe Jesus doesn't meet your expectations. He says he's despised. He's rejected of men, a man of sorrows. He was extremely sorrowful, not for himself. He wasn't having a pity party because he was going to experience hell on earth, that his body was going to be ripped apart and sin would be upon him. He was sorrowful for us. They're nailing him to a cross and he's saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. He's not sorry for himself. Sorry for them. He was a man acquainted with grief. Jesus knows what it means to suffer. If you've ever had to suffer through your hell on earth, Jesus knows what it's like. 
In Hebrews 4.15, I believe it is, it says, We don't have a high priest which can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Basically, it's saying, Jesus experienced every hardship you will ever face. He knows what it's like. If you're going through something, you say, Nobody knows how I feel right now. That's not true. Jesus does. And you think that the God of the universe allowed himself to be spat on, to be punched in the face, to be mocked. They threw a crown of thorns on him, gave him a reed, and, and threw a cloak over him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. To allow himself. As it says, we hid our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. He's doing this all on his own. We start out this chapter, it's very sorrowful. The whole thing is sorrowful, but beautiful at the same time. Because, because the person that this chapter is talking about is someone who changed everything. He's the most famous person to ever walk the face of the earth. He's not famous because he wants to be popular. He's famous because he changed everything. He changed everything for me. If you're a follower of Jesus, he changed everything for you. So let me ask you, are you rejecting Jesus this morning? Maybe you sit in your seat and say, Brent, I don't really, I don't really know about Jesus necessarily. I mean, there's some good things about him. I, there's some things I'm not too sure about. Listen, you can't be neutral about Jesus. Either you accept him or you don't. Jesus basically laid it out. Either you're with me or you're against me. I mean, that's a line in the sand. You cannot be neutral when it comes to Christ. So are you rejecting him? Are you with the multitudes that would say, I'm not going to call him Lord and Savior? And, and I, you know, one day every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus, not Buddha, not Muhammad, none of those guys, but Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. The, the, the point I make to you is it's much better to say that now than to wait and be forced to say it, Right? Because ultimately, what our society doesn't want is accountability. They don't want control to be given to someone else. To be, the control of their life to be given to, to God and them have to answer for their actions. That's ultimately what's, why society, for the most part, rejects Jesus Christ. Because he'll hold them accountable. Well, ultimately, you're going to be held accountable. And I'm here today as a pastor, as a preacher. This church is here today to tell you it's much better for you to make a decision for Christ now. Because you're not going to have a chance later on. They rejected his word. Have you believed what I said today? Because I haven't said anything that's inaccurate. I guarantee you, I take preaching very seriously. And I, in fact, I preach my sermon before I preach my sermon. I'm here at 730. I want to make sure everything is said that is right and kosher and I've studied and I'm ready to go. Have you believed me today? If you're lost, I encourage you to believe me. If you're saved, I, obviously you believe me. But there are those around you who don't. Have you rejected his power? The fact that, you know, think about some of your lives here. Um, my testimony isn't uh, extravagant necessarily. I grew up in church and got saved when I was 11. And, uh, you know, the, the, there's the same amount of grace to save me as there was to save Brian or anybody else. But some of you, your past was much different than mine. You had a very hard life. And people said it would be a miracle if you accepted Jesus Christ. And it was a miracle that you accepted Jesus Christ. But it was also a miracle that I did. Jesus Christ exhibited his power in my life that he, he saved me. And he saved you. So do you reject his word? Do you reject his power? Do you reject him? You know, when Jesus left this earth, physically, you know how big the church was? It was the same size Bridgeway is. We run about 120 folks on any given Sunday. It's 120 when he left. He didn't have a mega church when he left. Which, in one way, that challenges us. What could God do with 120 people here, right? That's pretty cool. Because what was 120 is now in the millions upon millions upon millions upon millions. Church, please know, if they rejected Jesus, they will reject you. 
but not everybody will. Not everybody will. So where are you at today? If you're lost, do you believe me? If you're saved, do you share what I just said? Because other people, they're not going to believe if they don't know about it. Where are we at today? Would you?